Well, we are starting. So we have finished. We're still in the canonical ensemble. Uh, and we created several examples so far. Uh, the last session was about the polymer model. Uh, I think we actually uh, gone through it quite thoroughly. And today we are returning to another exam example, which is the Einstein model. Einstein model for solids. So we have seen this example for the microcanonical ensemble. And it was a little bit quite difficult to compute all these combinatorics. Right? Uh, so first, let's remind us what the Einstein model is. So Einstein assumes the following thing. A solid, a cube, and inside this cube, there are a lot of different particles. Right? And each of those particles can vibrate like a harmonic oscillator in three dimensions. Right? So for each particle, there is x hat, y hat, z hat. So three degrees of freedom for vibration. And Einstein assumed that all of this stuff inside is completely uncorrelated. Each degree of motion, okay, uh, it's a harmonic oscillator, and he assumed that it's based on this, his ideas of the photoelectric effect, that the En for each degree of motion is N multiplied by h bar omega, we call it <coughs> omega zero, okay? And N goes from zero, one, two, three, etc., etc., etc. In total, we have three N oscillators. Three N oscillators, harmonic oscillators. Right. Why three N? Because the total number of particles is particles is N, and each of the particles can can vibrate in any di in uh, three dimensions. So basically, three degrees of freedom per particle multiplied by N. So this is three N. Everything is independent. Okay, so all the particles are independent from one from each other. Okay. And also the vibration uh, along each of the axes are completely independent. Okay. So we simply said, well, we have here three N harmonic oscillators. Each of them is completely independent and they all identical. Okay. Now, this is the starting point and here we assume what kind of ensemble do we have? If we solve this problem in the microcanonical ensemble and now we're going to solve it in the macro-canonical, uh, canonical ensemble. Okay, still not macro-canonical. Okay. So what one does, remember, what is the pathway for solutions in canonical ensemble or grand canonical ensemble? Okay, so we uh, need to compute Z, the partition function. Okay, it's, pr it's actually a little bit difficult. So we, all, we always use the same trick. What is the trick? We need to assume the, the energy is additive and re is represented as an energy of all the particles. And another thing that we need to assume, or at least make a representation, that all the different particles are independent. Now, those two assumptions are exactly what Einstein assumed for his model, because it's the most simple way to describe it. All right? So he says, well, all those degrees of freedom are completely independent. And of course, if they are completely independent, this is a part of his model, the total energy is the sum of all the energies of all the different harmonic oscillators. Okay. So everything is applicable 
we can use the canonical interval. Now, this is example of a thinking about a complex system in a simplistic physical way, right? Because we know that solids are complicated. Whatever is going on inside, it's a pretty complicated process. Now, as we've seen on Sunday, I cannot solve the complex problem. Right? I'm trying to read off everything and basically keep inside only the crucial ingredients of the problem. So this is Einstein's idea. That, well, I don't care about the complex uh, uh, interactions between the different atoms, between the different particles. I don't know what they are. I will just read, get real out of them and hopefully I will get on my way and my solution is going to be successful. Okay, so what is this z function? It is z1 to the power of 3n. Okay. Right? Because I told you the adjectivity holds, and because the particles are independent, factorization also holds. So I can represent the total canonical uh, partition function by the means of multiplication of a single uh, partition function of a single particle. What is this z1? It's a sum over i, or n, n goes from 0 to infinity, of e to the power minus beta n h bar omega. And we're using here 0. Very nice. So let's sum this. Right? What is the sum? Okay. Right, so it's a geometrical series, right? It, because we, we can write it as n equal to 0 to infinity of e to the power minus beta h bar omega 0 to the power n, right? So it is a simple geometric series, and we have a, a knowledge of this series. So the first term is 1 divided by 1 minus. And the multiplicator here is e to the power of minus beta h bar omega 0. e minus beta h bar omega 0. As you were assuming, the particles are distinguishable? Einstein assumed that. Distinguishable. Now, if they are indistinguishable, we can divide everything here by one factorial. We'll learn about this a little bit later where this 1 over n factorial comes from and why it's needed and sometimes it's not needed. So this is z1. In total, z is what? 1 over 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega 0 to the power of 3n. And we are done because if you want now to write the Helmholtz free energy, it's minus 1 over beta log of 1 divided by 1 minus e to the power minus beta h bar omega 0 to the power of 3n and it equals to 1 over beta 3n log of 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega 0 and this shows the power of canonical ensemble we do, we, everything extremely simple the moment that we can represent the system as something that is factorizable independent an additive, we just need to assume some look on one single particle, take it to the sum power, and we are done absolutely. That's it. Nothing else. <coughs> Remember, in the microcanonical case, in the microcanonical case, we had to work really hard in order to describe how exactly what are the, the exact quantas of energies are applicable to the specific energy of the system. It was a hard problem to solve. This is extremely easy. Why it's so easy? Because in the canonical ensemble, we don't have extremely harsh constraints, right? In the microcanonical, the energy is constant. In the canonical ensemble, the energy is not constant. Yeah, there is some specific average energy. The temperature is constant. So what? Okay? Much more easier. Okay. Now, the question is, does it work? Does it work? So what is the quantity that is measurable in an experiment? So for solids, for gases, and for some liquids, the specific heat is a measurable quantity that I can go to the an experimental lab and actually measure it. So the thing to test usually is CV, which is D do S to dot T, right? Where I'm keeping V constant. 
So I need to ob obtain this quantity and I already know what is F. F is this guy. Okay. So I do remember that dF is minus S D D minus P D V, right? So S equals to minus dF to dT. So I need to take the derivative of this guy with respect to t, then I obtain the entropy. The moment I have the entropy, I can take another derivative of the entropy with respect to t, multiply it by t, and then I have the specific heat. Okay. So let's do this uh, on the board. So we have d. Yes. What happened to mu? We don't consider mu dn. Yeah, but you don't really need it because you see, the moment that you have this expression, you already know that this entropy over here, because it stands in, st in front of the differential of dt, it's simply a derivative of f with respect to t. Yes, I don't care. I don't care whatever I, else I have here. Okay, so we have d to dt of minus of whatever stands over here. And now let's write it in terms of. Uh, temperature and not just beta. So this is 3n k Boltzmann t log of 1 minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 divided by k Boltzmann t. Okay. And I need to take uh, the derivative of this guy. So it's a multiplication over here. So I have 3n k Boltzmann log of 1 minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t uh, and I have a minus sign here yep. and I have minus okay. so let's do it over here this board the derivative of the logarithm so we have minus 3n k Boltzmann t multiplied by 1 over 1 minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t multiplied by minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t okay. uh, and then we need to take the derivative of this which is minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t uh, to the second part and another minus 1 over here. Okay. So what we have, the first expression is minus 3n log of 1 minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t. Okay, and here we have one minus, another minus, another minus, another minus. So in total, plus. Right, so we have plus 3nk Boltzmann t divided by 1 minus e to the power minus h bar omega 0 divided by k Boltzmann t. Okay, multiplied by all those nasty terms, which are uh, h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t squared multiplied by e to the power minus h bar omega 0 by k Boltzmann t. And hopefully I'm not wrong. Uh, you forgot k Boltzmann. Uh, Where? The first yeah. This? Yeah. K Boltzmann. Oh, very important. Great. So this is, this is what? This is S. What else do we need to perform? Another time. Very nice, right? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it fast. So, CV is equals to T, DS to DT. Uh, now we are going to perform this, which is, this stays minus 3N K Boltzmann we take the derivative of this guy, which is 1 minus e to the minus h bar omega 0 divided by k Boltzmann t, multiplied by <laughs> minus e 
to the power minus h bar omega zero by k Boltzmann t multiplied by minus h bar omega zero by k Boltzmann t squared multiplied by minus one. Okay, so this is the derivative of this part. Now we need to take a derivative of this part. Uh, we, will, we will treat this later. Um, or I will leave it for you to treat it. This is the best solution. Uh, you know, when, when you're stuck a little bit and you say, oh, it's a trivial thing, homework. <laughs> 3 n. Uh, oh, a quiz, yes, this is a better idea. <laughs> 3 n k Boltzmann h bar omega zero, okay? And we have divided by uh, k Boltzmann t, k Boltzmann, not no t, k Boltzmann, and we have t squared, and we have minus one. And what else do we have? And we have all of this multiplied by one over e to the power of h bar omega zero by k Boltzmann t minus one, okay? No, 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 I took a derivative. So what t and t squared, it was one over t, and then the derivative is one over t squared, and there is a minus over here. And I need now to take a derivative of, uh, so I had one over t and of this guy. So it is plus three n k Boltzmann h bar omega zero divided by uh, ah so there is k Boltzmann disappeared from here so there is no k Boltzmann so this is good it's k Boltzmann and t okay multiplied by one over e to the h bar omega zero by k Boltzmann t minus one second power it's a little bit lengthy yes with this, this is it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, squared. And what else do we have? Um, the exponent. So that we have the exponent, right? So, uh, wait. So this is two. So we have first of all minus one. Okay. And now we have the exponent, which is e to the h bar omega zero by k Boltzmann t multiplied by h bar omega k Boltzmann t squared multiplied by minus one. I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to see that this is okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't written the final solution, so I don't have a means to compare if it's okay or not. <laughs> Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, where, why? Where? Ah, oh, for everything! You're, you're right, so, so we do this by saying CV divided by T. That's easier, easier. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Okay. Now, we need to sort this out. We need to sort this out a little bit. It's not that difficult. It's really, really, really not that difficult to sort this uh, thing out. Because a lot of things is, uh, simply go away. There are KB over here and KB over here. And uh, you see this term and this term, they are not very, very, very far one from each other because we have the same denominator. Um, so it is not a difficult thing to perform, okay? Because uh, just think of, of this guy. So we take this downwards, and we have the same denominator, okay? And the only diff and upwards we have the same sign, the like h bar omega zero by k by t squared, etc. So those two guys basically annihilate each other, okay? So this guy and this guy, they simply cancel each other out. Right? Because here I have minus, 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 minus. 
and I have here have only one minus, so this is plus, this is minus, and everything else in those two terms is exactly the same. So this guy goes with that guy. You don't need that. Okay. We're left only with this term, okay, which looks ugly, but it's uh, actually quite nice. Nothing really uh, bad happens over here. Um, uh, and in total, it is a plus because we have minus and minus, so it's a positive, which is good because uh, the specific heat has to be positive. And we have some specific expressions that are left over. So we can write down that CV equals T. Do not forget the T. Okay? And we have also T over here. Okay? So we have uh, 3N, 3N, H bar, omega 0, uh, divided by K Boltzmann, T squared. Right, T Boltzmann T squared. We have here uh, H bar squared, omega zero squared. Okay, and what else do we have? Sorry? By T squared? No, 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 no. And we have E H bar omega zero by K, K Boltzmann T divided by one, one, divided by E to the H bar omega zero by K Boltzmann T minus one to the second power. Nice expression. Yeah. Very, very, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, so if you plot this guy as a function of t, this is cv, and we plot it as a function of t, it looks like this. Okay, it's converged. Converges to a constant. Okay. This converges to a constant. Okay. So the specific heat converges to a constant, which is 3n multiplied by some k Boltzmann t. By 3n divided by, by k Boltzmann. Okay. Now, they went to an experimental lab. Okay, and the plot of the actual specific heat for solids for high temperature. And this prediction of Einstein was right on stop, on, on spot. Very good, right? Well, Einstein was, and still is, genius. But what happens to, to lower temperatures? So what happens to lower temperatures? It went like this. And then we started to see some small deviations, right? So this is perfect, but this part is, well, uh, small deviations, right? Who really care about those small deviations? This is the interaction between the particles. Right? Now, we can say, well, th this is our extremely small deviations. We basically haven't assumed almost anything here, and it works so well. It works so well, so this is probably a fantastic idea. But then people, well, scientists are always picky. They say, ah, well, those are big deviations. We should explore what happens to those deviations. What, what is going on over here? 3n multiplied by k Boltzmann. Um, and when they look on this, so in the limit of t goes to zero, they discover the following thing. The Einstein model, the Einstein model was proportional to e to the power minus h bar omega zero k Boltzmann t. So when t goes to zero, this is a huge number, negative number, so the decay is exponentially fast. Okay, this is Einstein model. This is the prediction. Okay. It goes to zero. It goes ex to zero extremely fast. This is this part that we see over here. It basically dives toward the zero line. Okay. This is the red curve. <coughs> they looked on the experimental points and they discovered that it's proportional to t to the third. 
experiment. So this is those crosses over here in this region. Small temperatures. Okay. So this is experiment. And this is Einstein. This is a huge difference. A tremendous behavioral functional difference. This is an exponential decay, extremely fast, extremely, extremely, extremely fast. You cannot imagine anything that decays faster than this. And this is a parallel decay, which is actually slow. Okay. This, is a, this is tells us that the prediction of Einstein, well, it looks a little bit off when you look on the plot, but it describes a completely different physics. Okay. So Einstein wasn't still a genius, but he was absolutely wrong over here. Why he was wrong? Yes. He also, yeah? I guess the assumptions of the model no longer works. So he oversimplified it. Right? We always, what we try to say, well, we pick simple models and we use those simple models in order to describe real life physics. But sometimes the model that you pick, it is too simple. So his assumptions were very good for high temperatures, but they were lousy for low temperatures. And the guy that arrived after Einstein, who actually measured and thought about this problem, his name was Debye. So we are now going to say or learn what Debye or how Debye suggested to overcome this difficulty that we see in the Einstein model. Okay. This is the Debye model. Yeah. Debye model. Now, Debye knew that Einstein was a brilliant man, so he started from the point where Einstein started, but he said, well, he oversimplified. I have to correct this somehow. So if we plot again this idea of Einstein, okay, that we have a solid, and inside the solid we have a lot of particles, a lot of particles. He said, well, I cannot start with this assumption that everything is what? That everything is oscillator. So if I write a Hamiltonian of this guy, right? So if I write a Hamiltonian of, of this guy, there's going to be a kinetic energy, sum over i, from one to n. I will sum over all the particles. Each particle have this one half m, I, for example, right? X I dot square. Let's call it J. And it's also going to be J. J goes from perfectly. So J is the coordinate. Is J one is the x hat. J equals two is the y hat, and J equals three is the z hat. So we have a total sum for I from one to n, and J from 1 to 3. So this is the kinetic energy, which is simple, right? It's always an addition. And he also said, well, we also have some potential energy. And what is this potential energy? No, he said, this is actually, I don't know, some sort of a potential, which is a sum of all the different positions of all the particles. So we have to put inside this potential everything right so x1 1 x1 2 x1 3 x2 1 x2 2 etc 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 extremely long dependence of the potential energy on everything on everything okay so this is the hamiltonian that one should start with and solve it and then one can continue as Einstein to see if there is a factorization, if there is an additivity, yes or no? No. Yes. No. The problem is it's impossible to solve this, right? It's impossible to solve it. Why Einstein assumed something like harmonic oscillators? Because he needed a model that he can solve. If I start with something extremely complicated and long, I cannot do anything. So Einstein propagated forward by saying, well, I just have oscillators, and that's it. So Debye's brilliant idea, he said, well, Einstein is not so wrong. 
And this is why his model works for high temperatures. Okay. So what Einstein said, I have oscillators. If I look on this potential, he said, well, we know that solids vibrate, but it does not vibrate in what? It does not vibrate as, as every single particle of vibrating. There are some mutual <laughs> vibrations of groups of particles. Okay? They are somehow vibra vibrating together. There are waves or standing waves inside this every solid. So Einstein said, well, each particle is vibrating somehow. Device says, well, all the particles are vibrating. They are somehow correlated with each other. But maybe there is a way to actually rewrite this down. Okay? Instead of describing it in terms of positions of different particles, we will invent some set of new coordinates. And those coordinates are going to vibrate. Those coordinates we nowadays call phonons. And we will see how to obtain them from this potential. But the idea is that instead of looking on single vibrations of single particles, there are mutual vibrations. Think about what happens at low temperatures. You cannot simply shift one single atom. If one atom is uh, moving, all the atoms around it also start to move in coherent fashion. You, you had a class on waves. So the idea of, of uh, Debye was, well, I will describe this as if I have specific waves inside. Okay? So he said the following thing. I don't know still what waves I have inside. But let's assume that I do have a waves. Right? What happens then? And let's assume that those waves are represented and are all correlated with each other. Right? Because the only thing that I can make advanced with solving models in statistical physics is eventually forget about correlations. Okay? If all those waves are going to be correlated, strongly correlated, I cannot do anything. So he said, well, let's assume that we can take this Hamiltonian, we can diagonalize it somehow, okay? basically represent it as uh, in terms where this is a bunch of harmonic oscillators, but my coordinates are not going to be x1 or whatever, if they are going to be something else. And in this representation, which describes waves inside the solid, in this representation, I will continue as if I had this idea of Einstein. So he said, well, let's assume that I'm capable of making this transformation and describe this, this Hamiltonian as a set of harmonic Hamiltonians. What happens next? So we know what happens next if we have harmonic oscillators, which are uncorrelated, we know that z is always z1 to the power of 3n or whatever, right? Something like this. There is going to be multiplication. But this occurs only when? Identical. identical. Where they are not identical, what happens? No, no, no. Independent, not identical. 1, zi. 1 to 3n. Okay, so here, or I'm sorry, in the, in, the, in the work of Einstein, he assumed that everything is identical. But Debye cannot assume this. He says, well, I can make a transformation. There are different masses. So the particles, the minute particles, are not going to be identical. I cannot longer assume that all zi is equal to simply z1. Okay. I have to do something else. So I have to multiply all of them. But to compute each z, zi is simple, right? Because what is zi? Zi is a pi over uh, j from 0, or sorry, n from 0 to infinity, e to the power minus beta and h bar omega. But this omega is already a function of i. It's not supposed to be sigma? It's a yes. So this is the partition function. So if I have a particle which behaves as a harmonic oscillator, okay, which behaves as a harmonic oscillator, its partition function always looks like this. Okay, and we already know what this sum is. 
And this is simply 1 over 1 minus e to the power minus beta h bar omega i. So the waves don't affect the energy? Oh, they do affect the energy. But all oh, the problem is all those oh. omega i's. In Einstein, they are all exactly the same. Here, because of this crazy pot uh, potential, whatever, they're going to be different. Okay, so I, and I don't really know what those omega i's are. I don't know what those omega i's are. I need some way of representing those omega i's. Now, moreover, what we have done so far, so far we treated simple problems. In our simple problems, our parameters were discrete. Who said to me that the representation in terms of waves or harmonic oscillators, maybe those omega i's are very close to each other, maybe they are continuous, I don't really know. So Debye went forward and said, I want to find a representation where instead of this multiplication here, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a continuous parameter. So in order to solve his problem, because he couldn't assume that the om omegas are not discrete, they can be continuous. He has a continuous parameter in his problem. And in order to solve this, he needs to remodel everything in terms of continuous representation. Okay. So what happens or how I can describe everything when I have a continuous parameter? Okay. So let, let's look on if I have continuous spectrum of energies. What do I do when I have continuous spectrum of energies? Okay, so this is, was an introduction of why we need to, to actually treat continuum representation of parameters. We start with the divide, okay, and we understand that there is a continuum parameter. There has to be. And I will solve this integral, solve this Hamiltonian, and I will show you that omega i's have to be, can be continuous. Okay. Now, let's leave this introduction for a minute, and let's just see how, in general, we treat situations when we have continuum representation. Okay. This is called density of states. Density of states. Right? So if I have if I have energies which goes from E0 and E1 and E2 and E3 and E4, okay, and those are the different states that I have inside my system. My states are represented by a specific set of energies. Okay. In order to compute, okay, in order to compute what? In order to compute, for example, the average energy, what do I need to perform? I sum over my states, right? I goes from zero till infinity, and here I have E i multiplied by the Boltzmann factor. So this is minus beta E i divided by z. Right? This is the canonical representation. The average equals to a sum over all possible values multiplied by the probability to obtain this value. Okay? This is Nice and easy. So, uh, but in, in general, if I want to obtain an average value of some quantity O, it is, again, we've seen this before, it is sum over all the states from zero to infinity, OI e to the minus beta EI divided by Z. It's the same, and this is what we have used so far. It's very easy. You just need to count all the energies, and we have a sum over here. Now, but what happens if instead of discrete spectrum, I have a continuum spectrum. Okay, so uh, we know how to do this for probability, remember? This is a calculation, probabilistic calculation of the average. And liking probability theory, we, where we had a sum, 
right? The moment that our probabilities become continuous, instead of having a probability function, we have a probability density. We say that, well, it's a sum, this, this guy, a sum over i, o i, e to the power minus beta e i divided by z, right? So this guy goes to an integral over all the possible, all the possible <coughs> values of e. Here I have o, which is now a function of e, right? Any questions? Any questions? Because o e, okay, so the question, how do I know that o is a function of e? Now, here's the assumption that the state is completely defined by the energy. So, here I have different states, and states are represented by i, different energy. So, instead of using ei, or simply i, I'm using the value of e. Mm. Okay? Each value of e di represents different state. So, different values of o are corresponding to different values of e. No, this is a general. This is a general representation can I, uh, of, uh, of uh, the state of the system. But, but you're right. In, when we are going to talk about grand canonical representation, there's also a number of particles. Let's leave it for there. Okay. Yes? If I have multiple states with the same energy... Um, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So I have a lot of states inside of here. But in the summation, the summation is over the states or over the values of energy? But energy rep here represents uh, the different state. But if there are uh, multiple states with mm -hmm. the same energy... They're going to be, they're going to be exact. So whatever, what is going to happen? I'm going to unite them together, right? So it's just uh, mo uh, the probability here is just going to be multiplied by 2. So the probability here is the probability to be in the state or in the... Yes, energy? in the state. Okay. We still have this guy, e to the minus beta, right, beta e i, beta epsilon, beta e, divided by z, and we can say, well, this is d e over here, right? Not exactly, because right, if before we have counted just the states, now we need to say, well, how many, if, I, if I'm looking on this d e over here. And basically this integral is a counting scheme scheme for states. So instead of just counting them down, I'm saying, well, there is such and such amount of states for each de. How many exactly than the uh, amount of states that I, I have inside? So I know if I take this de and I multiply this by some function of e, this is the amount of states in interval DE. And this DE over here is what? The density, the density of states. Do you remember from the class on classical mechanics how to compute mass, right? So usually there was, a, at the beginning, there were, in, in mechanics, the masses were single particles, and then you had continuous mass, right? And then you had to compute what is the mass of a specific object. So if the mass was uniform, it was really easy. You just needed to compute the size of the object. But if the mass was not uniform, you had to perform a an integral over the whole size of the, p of, uh, of, uh, of the object, and you also have a de mass density over here. This is exactly the same. We have density of states. Okay. So any con computation of this guy over here have to be addressed also by this additional form, which the density of mass. Because otherwise, we don't sum the number of states that we have in an integral de. This portion over here inside the integral is simply the amount of states. Okay. And this is <coughs> the density of states. So each integral that we have 
need to be supplied by what is the density of states. Now remember, we have z's over here in the problem of Debye. And we have a continuous parameter, which is the omega over here. So in order to compute a multiplication or a summation, we need to sum over many, many, many expressions like this. But all of them have different omegas. How do we know what omegas are? Well, we don't really. But we do know that because omegas are continuous, we need to supply the density of states or the density of the omegas in order to continue this problem of divide. Okay. How do we do that? Okay. How we actually find, okay, this is the next question, If we have waves <coughs> inside a rigid body, how we obtain the density of omegas of this, these waves? This is the question that we have to ask ourselves in order to continue this quest of Debye and solving the uh, problem of, of, uh, of a solid. Right. What are those different omegas? How do we obtain them? Um, what you have seen with your TAs is uh, basically the final formula already for the density of states. So you already, part of you at least, know the final answer. Uh, we will prove it exactly on Sunday, but the idea, and this is how I want to finish this class, is remember, our goal is eventually to obtain representation, representation by means of waves of vibrations inside a solid. And we have to assume, we need to assume that all those vibrations are completely independent. This is one. And that those vibrations are sustainable. What do I mean? Okay. So we cannot look on all the waves that can happen inside the solid. Here I said, what are the waves? And what are these, the, the density of, of the omegas of different waves? So what we need to find is not all possible waves that we have inside a rigid body, inside a solid, but only waves that describe the vibrations that do not die off. Right? Like a single vibration of a particle is, will continue to vibrate for all the time. We also need to find now vibrations of many particles all together. This is exactly what wave is, a coherent motion of many particles. But we need to assume only or look only on the vibrations that do not die off. What kind of vibrations do you know? What kind of waves do you know that are, if you have them inside the body, they simply do not die off? Stating waves. Okay. So what we are going to, to do now, not now, but on Sunday, is to find the distribution or the density of the omegas of standing waves. Right? This is the quest. The moment that we will have it, we can continue with this Debye solution for the solid. See you on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> לא, 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 לא. נניח שיש לי הרבה חלקיקים. איינשטיין הניח שלכל אחד מהם יש, לכולם יש תדירות והם איכשהו מתנגדים. דיבי אומר את הדבר הבא. יש לך אוסף של גלים שעומדים בפנים. רק הגלים העומדים ממשיכים להתקיים. אבל התדירויות של הגלים האלה הן שונות. אני לא יודע מה הן. אני צריך לסכם כדי לקבל את הפרטישן פונקשן של כולם, אתה צריך לסכם על התדירויות של כל הגלים ביחד. שאלה שנשארים. אבל אתה לא יודע מה הן. אז אתה אומר, אני אמצא את הצפיפות. 
של הגלים האלה, ציטוט של התדירויות של הגלים האלה, ואז אני אעשה את הסיכום שלי, רואים את האינטגרציה של הגלים האלה. כלומר, יש לך גלים שחיים, הם לא עושים אינטראקציה אחד עם השני, אז גלים עומדים, הם יכולים להתקיים בתאר, ויש לך סופר פוזיציה, נכון? למדתם. יש לך סופר פוזיציה של גלים, זאת ההנחה. והם איכשהו מתנדבים לפני, במקום שכל חלקים זזו לפני, הם כולם זזים ביחד, אפשר לפרט אותם בגלים. ועכשיו במקום לסכם על חלקיקים, אני מסכם על התדירויות השונות המתקיימות בתוך התא. גלים, כן, בדיוק. זה כל הטריק שלו. הוא אמר, אני לא, הם לא מתנדבים ככה, הם מתנדבים ביחד, אבל כמו שתמיד אפשר לפרק לגלים, אז גם אני אפרק לגלים, ואז הם יהיו ללא אינטראקציה. נכון, זאת ההנחה שלו. אתה רוצה להחליף את זה ביי, כן? להגיד, אוקיי, אולי נתנו רק בקרובים להם? מה? זה יותר מסובך, הוא עשה משהו יותר כללי. אה, זה לא יותר פשוט שלא נראה לי? לא, לא, כי... אני נותן רק... האמת שאני לא יודע איך הוא חשב. אני יודע מה בסוף פורסם ואיך אני בסוף מבין את המודל. מאוד יכול להיות שאתה צודק, כשאני צודק. בסוף אתה מפרסם את התוצאה הסופית, חשבת פה. האם אתה צודק, אתה צודק. יכול להיות שהוא אמר, יש לי רק באינטראקציה בין השכנים הקרובים, ואז אני אתחיל מזה. ואז הוא הבין רגע, אבל יש לי פה גלים. נכון מאוד מיוחד. אה, הבנתי. אה, כלומר, בסוף הוא אמר, אז אני לא צריך רק את השתיים, שהם יהיו כולם ביחד. אז אני לא צריך רק את השתיים, שהם יהיו כולם ביחד. אז אתה מבין שבגלים יש סופר פוזיציה, ואתה יכול להניח שהם לא משהו חדש. אז ברגע שהוא הבין את זה, אז הוא לא צריך את כל הדברים בהם. אני לא יודע כמה זמן לקח לו להבין, לי לקח זמן להבין מה הוא רוצה כן, בדיוק. כי אתה תסתכל, זה כמות מצבים של גודל חסר יחידות, זה אנרגיה, זה חלקי אחד חלקי נור. זה כמו בצפיפות הסתברות, זה תמיד אותו דבר בצפיפות הסתברות, נכון? זה תמיד אחד חלקי... כן. התחלתי לעבוד על התרגיל החדש, אמרתי, לא משנה מה אני עושה
לא, אני מעתיק. מעתיק?